Welcome to part two of the K&T Mill vertical head mount. Um, here I'm just uh, switching over the machine from the horizontal cutter to use an end mill in the spindle. Just thought I'd show it for some of those of you who hadn't, uh, haven't seen the horizontal mill in action too much. I'd never seen one in action really either until I saw uh, uh, watching Keith Fenner and Keith Rucker. I had a uh, Van Norman number 12, but I don't know if I, I guess I did use it a couple times in horizontal mode, but in that one, the head rotates 90 degrees, so you can use it in horizontal or vertical, but uh, that was almost always in vertical. I can only think of one time I used it in horizontal mode. Um, as I mentioned in the last video, this arbor that came with the machine has got a bit of a bend in it. It's pretty close to the where the arbor mounts in the spindle, so it's hard to deal with uh, a little later on I'll show an attempt to uh, make a little better running arbor that with, uh, was moderately successful. As you'll see in a little bit, one of the issues with the uh, Horizontal mill is visibility when uh, trying to use an end mill. I'm trying to see the what you're cutting as I videotaped or filmed the back of my head for a lot of that segment that I had to edit out, so you didn't have to look at the back of my head. Um, that was that is one of the downfalls when you're trying to mill on the horizontal mill with the uh, with an end mill or something in the spindle. As I mentioned in part one, the, this particular Kearney and Trekker mill, it's the 2HL Universal. The Universal is the fact that the table can tilt from side to side, which if you couple it with a uh, K&T dividing head, you can cut helical gears. I have the I have a K&T dividing head, but it's the one for the next si the machine, the next size up, the size that uh, I believe it's the size that Keith Rucker has. And uh, it's a little big for this mill, but it came up for sale in the local classifieds and the price was good. So I picked it up and hopefully I'll get a chance to uh, show that being used at some point in the future. When I got the machine, the uh, power feeds weren't working and the uh, owner the shop that I got it from said they thought it was a clutch adjustment. It turned out it wasn't a clutch, but just a woodruff key was missing in the, one of the cams that adjusts the gears for the speeds. It took me a while to figure it out, and pulling the knee out of these mills is kind of scary. It makes the six-speed manual transmission in my F350 look like a fairly simple piece of machinery. It's amazing what, uh, what they were able to do with those mechanical feeds. And here you can see part of the issue with uh, setting things up in the horizontal mill is trying to see exactly where you're going to be cutting. As uh, this is not tight tolerance work, it wasn't too critical here. And here I'm just trying to open up a, a spot in that T-slot to drop the uh, T-nuts in to get them into the uh, T-slot. Before I edited the video, most of the, the video was the back of my head. But like I said, it was kind of hard to see what I was doing without getting in the way of the camera. I guess I could have moved it to the other side of the mill and that would have worked great. I'm not sure why I didn't think of that at the time, but I didn't. And uh, so we'll just get that slot opened out enough to get the, the T-nuts in and then We'll take a look and see how everything fits up. After using the Van Orman for a few years, with I didn't even have the X feed working on it, uh, the uh, rapid traverses and the uh, power feeds on the Kearney and Trekker sure are nice. I'll 
sure make uh, most of the operations you do a lot more convenient. I think uh, that little move there left the nice apprentice mark that you'll get to see later. I, I think apprentice mark is the technical term that uh, I've heard used for the the uh, marks in the places you don't really want them. But just trying to get that opened out the right amount. I guess I could have measured things and figured it out, but I kind of trialed and narrowed it to get those T-nuts in there. And here we finally er, had success of getting the T-nuts in. Here's the mount with the uh, T-nuts in. You can see the register that registers the back of the uh, vertical head. And you can see the apprentice mark there where uh, I ran the end mill in a little too deep. You'd think with a 200 thousandths gap I could have avoided that, but apparently not. It was so fun to have the T-nuts in there and have them sliding around. I had to do it for a while because uh, I was never quite sure if this whole thing was going to work. But I uh, was pretty excited that it had worked. Here I've got some hex bar to make the nuts that will hold the mount, the head onto the mount. And uh, here I just threw in a clip of changing the uh, jaws around. Uh, these are the two-piece jaws, so you have to take them off and flip them around. Uh, when you need to switch them for inner and outer work. Um, I know some of the lathes have a jaws that you remove to flip around on these two-piece jaws. You undo them and put them back on. The lathe that uh, came out of uh, UCLA's nuclear engineering department, according to the gentleman I bought it from, he had, uh, was a machinist there for 38 years, and when he retired, they were uh, surplusing the uh, at three handy lays. They were surplusing, and so he uh, had bought one. But then uh, health issues had kept him from ever getting it up and running, and it kind of sat in the back of his garage for a few years. And apparently, a few people had run into it because uh, most of the handles on the apron were broken. And uh, some of the handles had been bent. I had to, took a little time to get those fixed up. But uh, he was, uh, I was uh, bought it on eBay. I was the only bidder. And uh, he had, when he had advertised it as a smaller lathe, when I drove my truck down to pick it up, I realized I wasn't going to be able to put a 5,600 pound lathe in the back of my truck and drive 500 miles home. So the trip turned into. Turned out to be for naught, but uh, he had offered to refund my money, was very apologetic for the, the mix-up, but uh, he was uh, said, he's, since I was the only one who bid on it, that uh, he was going to have to scrap it uh, because he just couldn't, didn't, ha had to get it out of the way. So I figured out how to tie another trip back down to California to pick it up it, to a uh, anniversary trip and went back with a trailer and was able to pick it up. So. Two trips to California kind of wiped out the savings, but it uh, was worth it to keep it out of the scrapyard. As it did come out of a student, I don't know how I don't know how many of the students ran it, but uh, given the the dings in the compound I, where it's been run into the chuck a few times, I suspect the students were allowed to use it somewhat. But fortunately, it, being in a school shop, it wasn't in a production environment. It seems to be in pretty good shape. Um, I can usually get parts into the chuck with the, just a few thousands run out for an old three-jaw chuck. It's, it runs pretty good. Here we're going to try some tapping, but uh, 
with a Jacob style chuck it just seems like you can't get a tap to stay worth anything and uh, it just seemed to spin so I'll just get it started with the lathe and then I'll uh, then I have to pull the tap out of the chuck and finish it off by hand. This is just a cheap deburring tool from I think it's from Harbor Freight, but it's kind of nice for cleaning up the burrs and holes on the lathe. Makes pretty quick work of it. After watching one of Keith Rucker's videos, I realized you kind of have to make the tops of the uh, your uh, homemade nuts and bolts pretty. So I had a, a pretty large radius. I think it's like a three and a half inch radius form tool that I picked up in a lot of tooling I bought on eBay, and I thought it might make a nice looking head for the nuts, and uh, it actually did. Did a nice job of cutting the heads and gives them a nice domed look. There's the finished product. Makes a nice looking little nut that can reach down into the counter bores on the head and seat it in there. Um, I didn't want the nuts just turning on the counter bore, so I thought I better make some washers to fit uh, beneath the nuts in the counter bore so that they weren't riding just on the bottom of the board. Just clamped a nut in the three jaw, put some washers on a bolt and tightened it up. Wasn't sure if it would sp they'd spin, but they seemed to work pretty well and was able to turn them down so they'll fit down in the counter bores. just the right size to put down in there actually a grade 8 hardened washer so here's some photographs of the finished product We've got the t-nuts the bolts the washers and the uh, and I just took some half 13 threaded rod welded them into the t threaded them in and welded them in the t-nuts ground off the welds here it is mounted in the head mount and then here we've got a couple photos of the uh, head hanging from the engine hoist. And there's the heads of the bolts. And then around the back side, there's the mount fitted up and ready to go. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. In part three, we'll look at uh, making the next part that allows the head to nod front to back. Uh, I didn't know if I needed that feature, but decided I did and turned into a lot of work.